Romans, I'm going to begin at, at verse 12, and I, I actually have a bit of scripture, so I just want to read this to you, and then I'm going to let you be seated, and then I'll go through the rest as I uh, preach this morning. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh to live after the flesh. Are you hearing me? Hearing what Paul's saying? For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But a poignant song to sing prior to reading this. But if you live through the spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body. You shall live. Oh, that's so much easier said than done. The, the blessing of being in America turns to be a curse because eternity doesn't care where you're from. Doesn't care about the color of your skin. Doesn't care how little money you had or how much money you had. All of us, no matter who, where, what you are, have to mortify the deeds of the body so that we may live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God. And I, I hear it so often so today, and it alarms me that people say, well, I don't even know if I hear from God anymore. I don't even know if I, I felt God. And I'm like, my God. The Bible even talks about he's near to us. He's near. If you're not feeling him, who moved? That, that, that's an indictment. And, it, you know, there's a catchy story that goes with that about a man and woman driving down the road and the lady's driving around and talking about how they used to cruise together when they were young and, you know, and go out and all that. And the man says, you know, men get beat to death when we get silent as we get older. And the guy says, well, you know, I haven't moved. We do that with God. I said, we do that with God. They are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. But ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit. We know when we're right with God. We know when we're distracted. Can we be honest? Can we tell it? We know when our lives are focused on all the other things and God is taking a backseat. Or like for those of you that aren't here in time, didn't hear Brother Lulu talk this morning about leftovers. If you, didn't, if you didn't hear that, it would behoove you to be here on time. You're, you're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> I don't know. When you spend four hours more than that on a Friday night with pastor, you're not. You're, 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 you're working hard, so. Yeah. <laughs> and if children, then heirs of God. And join heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him. <laughs> that we may also be glorified together. For I reckon, and that word reckon is an accounting term. Some of us are good at accounting dollars and cents, but have you accounted for eternity? That the sufferings, you didn't get it your way, life doesn't look like you don't think it should, you really are more concerned about the comfort and the house and the car and the clothes, and you'll just give God your hour and a half on a Sunday. But there are going to be those, and I'll say this right here now, that are day in and day out living for God, going to church, praying, outreaching, witnessing, doing all the things. That, trust me, he's, if he says he's coming for a church, there'll be a church when he gets here. I just want to make sure I'm in it. Are you hearing what Paul's saying here to the Romans? The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Let's place our Bibles. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Jesus, we need you. We, Lord, we love you, Lord. We need your help. 
today. Open our eyes. Give us revelation. Give us understanding. Allow the scales to drop so that when we look at life and we look at society, we hear the words and we hear what's being said and propagated, Lord, that we would know and understand what saith the Lord, that would be led of the Spirit of God, that we would not be deceived by that deceiver that's come to steal, kill, and destroy, but we would hear of you, God, who wants to give us life and that more abundantly in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Give someone a high five close to you there, and you can be seated, an air elbow or whatever floats your COVID-19 boat. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. You can be seated. <laughs> you know, I haven't said it to myself long enough or enough. There's a lot of things that have crept into my life. There's just a lot of things that I've gone after in my life. When Jesus was being tempted, when Jesus was at a weak point after fasting, he says in Luke 4 and 8, and Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. He really didn't mince words there. It's pretty clear. But we live in a gray area time. We are surrounded by everybody's a Christian. Well, Let me stay off of some of that. I'm just staying in the Bible here. I'm going to be reading of a story in 1 Kings chapter 18. Most of you know it. It's where there's a, there's a conflict and things have come to a head. The Bible says, And Elijah, Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if thou, and that's what they served then, we got our bowels today. Mm -hmm. Then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Well, if I don't say anything, I don't make a decision. Mm -hmm. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I, only remain a prophet of the Lord. But thou's prophets are 400. And for you're going to find there's going to be a whole lot more they're going to be propagating a doctrine that's not of God. Then those are, it's, 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 it's in the Bible. It's in the word that men shall be lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. It's the time that we live in. Can we, can we be honest that we are surrounded by, there's a lot of verbal junk out there. There's a lot of noise. It's imperative that you know the Bible. Now, I'm going to be honest. I'm going to stay in the word. I have no problem anybody going, lining up with what I preach and teach right out of here. Because I teach right out of here. I haven't created my own doctrine. I'm preaching it and teaching it just like the apostles did. And I have no problem with you lining up what I preach and teach right out of here. I, I, you may get my opinion, but those but that's my opinion when I express something. But understand, we'll be judged by the word of God. Okay. Let them therefore give us two bullocks and let them choose one bullock for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood and put no fire under. And I will dress the other bullock and lay it on the wood and put no fire under. And call ye on the name of your gods, plural, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God that answereth by fire, everybody say, you're going to answer by fire. Mm -hmm. Let him be God. And all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. Well, Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, choose you one bullet for yourselves and dress it for ye are many and call on the name of the Lord your gods, but put no fire under it. And they took the bullock which was given them and they dressed it and called on the name of Baal from morning until noon. And we barely make it from 10 to noon. Mm 
Don't ever question the faithfulness of the worldly to their gods. <laughs> Pastor, move on. Get on now. Get away from me. Oh, thou, hear us. How many times have we call like that out to the things in our life? But there was no voice, nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar which was made. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them. I'm going to say this. Listen, don't get mad at the pastor for getting attitude when he's got an I told you so on you. Pastor shouldn't talk like that. Pastor shouldn't say that. I've been, what are you talking about? Sometimes you'll only get it till you've done something dumb. And I go, what did I say? Right? How many of us turn around and we look at our kids and we give them the right advice and then they come up with something dumb? There's, there's nothing new under the sun, folks. And then I told you so as in I don't like you and I told you so as I love you. I tried to keep you from that. Please understand where I'm coming from. Does that make sense? And said, cry aloud, for he is a God, lowercase g there, you have to understand. Either he's talking or he's pursuing or he's in a, a journey or for adventure, he's sleeping and must be awake. And they cried aloud, and listen to this. <laughs> they cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets. Not too much different today with all the piercings and the cuttings and the gauges and the tattoos and all the crazy, you want to fit in the world? Yeah, there's some crazy stuff to you, Othell. The mindset of just going with what the world wants you to do. It's crazy. And I hate to break it to you. I'm not going to hate myself because of my birth. That cancel culture? Really? You're out of your mind. I'm not apologizing for nothing. Mm-mm. -mm. I'm not going to have no one apologize. Now, I don't know if he ever had any children, but if Charles Manson had children, I don't think he should have to pay for what he, they should have to pay for what he did. So why would I make, are you hearing what I'm saying? Let's, let's put things in perspective and be honest here. Let's not get all sideways what's going on around in the world, okay? Reparations, look, I'm an American Indian. If you want to do reparations, you better get back to me. Let's be real. Because if we want to talk about reparations, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you, let's give reparations. Let's say, okay, you can stay here, or the reparations will give you a we'll give you a plane ticket. It doesn't make sense for people to talk about that when we got thousands of people lined up at our border wanting in here. Don't criticize a Christian nation. It's made this a wonderful place to live. I know a lot of people don't like it. You don't have to believe this way, but don't deny that it made it a wonderful place to live. The power and the blessings of God has made America wonderful for hundreds of years. Thank God for our forefathers. Thank God for the Constitution. Thank God. Now, I know people want to adjust it and change it and attack it, but I'm sorry getting after Mr. Potato Head or Miss Potato. Really? All the things we got going on in the world, and that's as far as you can get? Please. Mm. And they prophesied in, until the time of the offering of the evening service, and there was neither voice nor any answer nor any that regarded. And Elijah said unto all the people, because they're done. He's like, okay, you're done. Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell. Everybody said, God answers by fire. Mm-hmm and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, Lord, he is God, Lord, he is God. And Elijah said unto them, take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they took them and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. We have to be careful of our words. We have to be careful of our words when we're talking about God, when we're talking 
period. The Bible says we'll be judged by every idle word. Are you hearing what I'm saying? A doctor was called and he was asked to come and visit a sick man that was way out of town and he was bedridden so they couldn't get him to the, to the doctor. The wife who made the call said, listen, I'm sorry to ask you to come all the way out here so far, but he's really sick. The doctor said, oh, that's quite all right. I actually already have another patient in the neighborhood, so I'm just going to come out and kill two birds with one stone. Not the best choice of words for a doctor. We need to be careful how we speak. And so in our story, Elijah went before the people and said, how long? One version says, waver between two opinions. If the Lord is God, follow him. But if thou, is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. And he goes through all that with the bulls and the sacrifice. And we know that the prophets did everything and nothing happened. And then Elijah does it, and then he takes all that 12 barrels of water during a drought. Are you hearing me? You have to understand what's going on here. God caused a drought because the leadership, the people, were doing evil. King Ahab and Queen Jezebel are purely evil. It was under their rule that Israel has gone further down the path towards paganism than ever before. God notice your bent. God notices your direction. God notices the ebb and flow of our lives. Some people resist the worship of Baal at this time, but there were only a few. And sadly, they were keeping their thoughts to themselves. I don't want to say anything. Isn't that kind of where we're being shoved today? Most of the people, though, are just going through the motions and worshiping God and still partying with thou worship. They weren't committed either way. They were just going with the flow. And Elijah had been preaching that they had to return to God, but King Ahab keeps Elijah running for his life. I'm not good at running. I'm not good at running. So they're just going to have to come get me. Are you hearing what I'm saying? But Elijah's playing hide and seek with Ahab, and finally God goes to Ahab, tells, Ahab, tell, tells Elijah, go find Ahab. Go meet with the king. So Elijah sends for Ahab. And after a little mutual of Ahab greets Elijah, oh, thou that troubleth Israel. And Elijah goes, I'm not the one troubling Israel, you backslidden reprobate. They have their little. So don't think pastors don't have a problem down there with people and have to just flat out tell the truth. Can we be real? And so I say, okay, let's have this show down on Mount Karma. You come, I'll be all by myself. You bring your 450 prophets of Baal, bring your Jezebel, do your thing, and we'll see what happens. And we know what's long. But Elijah started this whole thing when he, he looked at the people and said, how long? And when you look at the translations, there's things he says here. How long will you hobble back and forth between two opinions? How long will you be crippled by two opinions? Have you ever been in a similar situation where you knew someone was right, but you didn't want to be that one person to step forward to fight the tide and stand with the right? Well, it was a day to be remembered this day when the multitudes of Israel were assembled at the foot of Carmel, and when the solitary prophet of the Lord came forth to defy the tide of society. Here he is, right, right there upon the hill of Carmel, along the plain. There were three kinds of people there gathered. First, the few devoted servants of Jehovah. Second, the servants of the evil prophets of Baal. 
But in all honesty, the vast majority of all these people gathered for this amazing Super Bowl of spiritual warfare were those who were wavering between two opinions. You didn't know whose side they were on. When they were with church people, they acted like they were churchy. When they were with worldly people, mm -hmm. in all honesty, we've got those classes of people listening right now. So I am speaking on the issue of if God be God, then serve him. Israel had come out, listen, Israel had come out of Egypt. See, it's all tied together. They had been delivered. They were brought out in, in an amazing deliverance. 40 years in the wilderness, and things went well until the time of Judges. And then it, it says in Judges 2 and 10, and also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers. And there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. It was a national backsliding event. The situation became much worse under Ahab and Jezebel. They forced idolatry. They forced, you're going to think this way. You're going to act this way. You're going to speak this way. We're going to mandate and pass laws to tell you what's right and what's wrong. Anything sound familiar to today? I know you're not running and jumping, but I hope someone's getting spiritually awakened here. I can tell you, honestly, that this same type of language that was going on then is being spoken right now in the political halls and buildings of our country right now. It's in our schools. It's in homes. And I'm going to be honest, if you're watching and TV and you got a TV and you're watching that all the time, you are being indoctrinated. That's why they call it a program. Mm-hmm. The wonderful thing that even in all that, no country, no individual, no person is being redeemed or reclaimed by God. If God could save Nineveh, if God could reach Saul of Tarsus, I'm telling you, despite the way the country goes, the nation goes, the cities go, society, God is still able to redeem that person that says, wait a minute, I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm not going that way. So understand, before the coronavirus hit, America had dropped from 70% church attendance in the 1970s to only 18% last year. And only 3% of those 18 to 25 went to church. Under this coronavirus picture, things kind of got worse because all American churches were forcibly closed for the minimum of two months. And some states are still hindering churches opening right now. One third of former members who've been watching online services quit watching after only six weeks. Effectively saying, they pretty much backslid. Oh, it's easy to not take it serious. It's easy to worship bow when you're surrounded by it. It's hard to really stand out and stand up. It's so easy just to go with the, I've got a job, I've got bills, I got this issue, I got health issues, I don't want to go nowhere because of coronavirus. I don't want to. Mm. But in our biblical text, God sent the message to Israel through the prophet Elijah to kickstart a revival. God loves people and God loves you and, and God cares. And though there's a lot of people that are simply going to reject him, God has set before you and I and this world an open door to be saved. You don't have to go with the flow. You can exit, stay your right. To, you can say, you know what? I'm not going that way. I'm not going to be a part of that. I love you, but I'm not doing those things. I'm not going there. I'm not going to be a part of that. I may have to walk alone or no longer with you, but I choose Jesus today. 
the issue we have, and we've got to face it, and we've got to come clear today and be honest. We've got some Christian people wavering between two opinions. You're wavering. I'm not trying to call you out. I'm trying to call you up. And Elijah makes a statement, how long are you going to keep wavering? How long are you going to keep limping? How long are you going to keep vacillating? You have Almighty God and the prophets of Baal. Polytheism. Polytheism is the worship or a belief in multiple deities which is a direct violation of God's commands in his word. Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5, Hero is where the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with thy soul and all thy might. So you have to understand they weren't rejecting Baal or Jehovah Holy. They weren't rejecting the whole thing. But as polytheists, they believe that both gods might be worshipped. You guys are cool with that. That's okay, right? Because that's what the world's doing today. That's what it is. Some of you are so caught up in politics, you put it at the level of God's word. That's all that comes out of our mouths. We're all worried about that. We're putting more time on that. We're mad about that. And I get it. I get it. I live in this country too. And I'm like, hey, bottom line is, as for me and my house, I'm, I'm going to come back to it. I'm, I'm not going to watch it. not going to listen. don't want to know. They're going to do what they're going to do. God's going to do what he's going to do. As for me, I, I, want, I want to be with what God's doing. But listen, they thought that each deity, deity could have a share of their hearts. And all the married folks said, hmm. So God's like, I'm going to send the man of God to them to tell them you can't do that. I won't accept that any more than you would with your partner. If God is the creator, the life giver, is if he's eternal, immortal, invisible, omnipresent, unopponent, then God deserves our whole devotion. Will God be satisfied with half or a divided devotion? Can we tell the Almighty that areas of our lives are off limits to him? God is a jealous God. Now, that's an attribute you wouldn't think God would have, but nevertheless, the Bible says it. He wants all our love or none of it, and he won't take only part. The Lord Jesus says, you can't serve two masters. But he defined it because we have a struggle. We've got to pick whom we're going to serve. Jesus said in Matthew 6 and 24, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will hold the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You have to understand that really applies to us today because God and mammon actually talks about money. How long halt? We don't use that word today in that context, but in, that con in the context he's talking about, it literally means to limp. It literally means to be lame. He paints this picture of the absurdity of their present condition. While they're not making up their minds, they are staggering back and forth. While they're not making up their minds, they're wavering. The translation is used to describe a cripple. A person whose legs are out of joint. Walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Right. Choose the straight path. The, it's there. The connotation is there. But way back in this battle, it's all about how you walk. But people are crippled between two opinions. That's why you never get far. That's why you get stagnant in God. That's why you can walk in where the amazing presence of God and you don't feel a thing. So this is the description of those that are crippled spiritually by trying to serve more. 
than two masters. God hasn't left you. God hasn't bailed on you. He don't want just half of you. And so he's like, okay, when you're ready to put away all the idols and put away all the junk and put away the 450 other things you've got in your life, you'll stop limping. You won't be a spiritual cripple. Jane talks about these folks. They're wishy-washy. They're lame in their walk. They're crippled spiritually. He says in James 1, 6 through 8, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. I'm not crippled. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea. It's driven. It's moved by the winds. It's moved by society. It's moved by everything, everybody. Let me tell you something. One of the most frustrating things you're going to find about a good, solid person of God, they'll answer everything with Scripture. What did Jesus do? It is written. It'll frustrate you because you want to, we want to find gray areas. Hey, they did me wrong, God. Surely when I turn the other cheek, I can take my right. We don't know anybody like that, do we? We want gray areas because it makes it comfortable. We make it easy. We want it, it makes us to have ought with people and still go on. It makes us cheat on our tithe and offering and all oh, God will forgive you. It makes us despise our brother or sister, backbite, gossip, deceive. I'm going to live another way when I'm not here at church. Pastor, I'm all with you here, but let me say one thing you don't like and you're ready to. Let my brothers or my sisters say something. We don't have forgiveness. We just leave. Divided homes, divided churches, bow worship, worldly worship. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. He that wavers like a wave driven of the sea and wind top. Listen, listen, there's a qualification on your walk. Let not that man think how he shall receive anything of the Lord. How you walk matters. How you think, what you quote, what you talk about, what you say, what you stand upon. Better be careful. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Double-minded literally means two-spirited hypocrites. Double-minded, wavering, uncertain, doubting, divided in interest. I love looking at translations. And even though I don't always use them in preaching because the last thing you need is a translation for something that's not going to help you. But today I do want to share it with you. How long will you waver between two opinions? How long will you hobble back and forth between two opinions? How long will you sit on the fence? How long will you hesitate? How long will you be divided between two ways of thinking? That one translation garners most of my attention, and it says, how long will you go limping? How long will you limp? How long will your Christianity limp? Isn't it time for people to stand up and be strong? Isn't it time for saints of God to stand up and say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord? Isn't it time to quit getting our human opulence and anger and shaking our fist at God and turn around, not my will, but thy will be done? You can't say nothing because I said to you this the other morning, so don't answer. When did Jesus die? Don't answer because I told you Friday night. When did Jesus die? Where? You just schooled everybody. Come on. No one wanted the answer. But not really. He died in the garden when he said. Yeah. 
See, some of us aren't dead. We call these altars in the, in the church. People come and you, you lay your altar. See, the problem with being a living sacrifice is when you don't like something, you get back off there. No, I'm going to do it my way. How dare that whippersnapper preach something right down my street today. I ain't taking that one. I'm getting off. I, in fact, I ain't going to go. I ain't going to go to an altar. I, oh, I'm, mm. And you think you're strong, but you don't realize you are limping. You are limping through life. You are limping spiritually. You are, God's called you to be strong, called you to be spiritual. But instead, we bought into the mindset of the world. We don't believe God. We don't trust God. And now we're limping. Listen. I'm appealing to somebody today. Satan, you can be certain, is laughing at weak-minded, vacillating saints of God that once preached or once believed or once quoted or once read the Bible that now vacillate between their opinion and what the world's doing and how they feel and they're lit. And they never go anywhere. God hasn't stopped being God. And God hasn't stopped anointing men and women. And God hasn't stopped... God still answers by fire. He still answers by fire. But you got to get back on that sacrifice altar and say, not my will, but thy will be done. How long will you limp? In 1935, you can be seated, as Adolf Hitler was on his political rise, he had a stranglehold on the church already. The brown shirts. Go do some history. That he actually was able to get the church to buy into, buy into Nazi ideology. Oh my God. What's new? They're doing it right now. It's right now in the halls of our political system. That shouldn't irk you more than where you're at on your altar. I'm just using this to bring out a point. Because Adolf Hitler was able to do that just like the Israelites of in Elijah's time. They were hard. They tried to serve both because they wanted to get along. They didn't, oh, no, I can't, oh, no, they'll hurt me. Oh, they get, oh, I can't make, oh, oh. Folks in Germany found a way to be both believers in Christianity and supporters or supporters of Nazis. Talk about a biblical stretch. And we're seeing this in America right now. Hello, Facebook. Here's me. there are still people who refuse to compromise. And those people back then, like the people soon, today, were dragged off the concentration camps. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a Protestant pastor, professed sympathy for Jewish victims, and proclaimed Christianity and socialism were incompatible. He was executed for those beliefs one month before the war was over. Are you hearing me today? Martin Niemöller was a contemporary of Bonhoeffer. That means he was there at the same time. He was a lukewarm pastor in Hitler's Nazi Germany. He was also, and I don't know how, but he was an anti-Semite. So he welcomed the Third Reich. In 1934, after a meeting with Adolf Hitler, his sympathies began to change. And he learned that his phone had been tapped by the Gestapo. Listen, folks, they're watching your Facebook. They are watching your phone. My wife's wanting me to probably shut up right now. She says, I, it may be coming down, but not today. 
because there was a police state. I'm telling you what you can. You have to understand, we just had a sitting president who completely annihilated off of any communication with the American people. So quit acting like what I'm talking about is not happening. It's in your lap right now. Right now. The Bible says there's going to be a great falling away. People are going to be, even, even the very elect will be deceived. So if you think you stand, take heed, you might already be falling or limping. So, he started a group that he helped, and it was called the, the, the PEL, the Pastors Emergency League. And so they were surveilled by the Gestapo, and he came to view the Nazi state as a dictatorship and later opposed it. And he is probably best remembered for this quote. First, they came for the socialists, and I didn't speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade, trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. You have to understand, if you won't stand with the church and you won't stand with the pastor, you're standing with the wrong side. You need to hear this. You can't be silent here. Jesus said, either you're for me or you're... The gray area we create. Mm. The gray area the enemy wants us to be right there. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Nehemiah was admitting that he and others had not stood up for what was right. And by then it was too late. We are warned about indecisiveness in the book of James. Like I read to you, he, he that wavereth is like a wave blown and tossed about such a person is double minded and unstable in all they do Man, we got those waves run blowing and we got that storm right now mm -hmm. when we cannot make decisions relative to our faith we become lukewarm when we're not honest or, or strong or adamant we're moved there is no neutral and the danger of neutral is you can be shoved either way depending on where the pressure is. If we're lukewarm, our church becomes lukewarm. When our churches become lukewarm, our cities become lukewarm. When our cities become lukewarm, our country becomes lukewarm. Revelations 3, 15 and 16 tells us, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I am a spew you out of my mouth. The church has got to stop limping. His fan in it is in his hand and he will thoroughly purge the floor. It's time to stop limping and wavering. Our country, our children, our church and our souls are at stake. Psalms 33 and 12 says, Blessed is the nations who God is the Lord and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. Today, so many people like us are like the Israelites at Mount Carmel. You haven't studied your Bible enough to say yea or nay. Or maybe you've gone through enough that you no longer hold to its validity. And you question God, but not yourself. We're not saying, this is what the Bible says. And so we limp around, toss like waves, and not knowing where to stand. Now I know, and I said it earlier, that the name of today's gods are different from Elijah's time. We all have our own bowels that we struggle with. We waffle between what God called us to do and end up committed to neither God nor the false God. We're just lukewarm. Barely limping from church service back to our worldly lives. From singing songs about God and limp home to watch hours of godless programming. We may not realize that we're becoming a nation of hokey pokey Christians. 
when it comes to our faith in God. We put our right foot in and we take our right foot out, put our left foot in and we shake it all about. We do the hokey pokey and we turn ourselves around because we don't know if we're in or out. And it's not that any of us are bad people. We just got to make a decision. Stop, Paul. It's as simple as a decision. I'm going to go all in with God or I'm not. And God said, that he's fine with that. <laughs> we have to go all in with God. We have to put our whole selves in and never take ourselves out. The saddest person in the world is a person who has too much of God to enjoy the world, but too much of the world to enjoy the pleasures and power of God. Isaiah said, there is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. If you've lost your peace, it's time to make up your mind. How long? How long? The question indicates that they, the Israelites, had already taken too long to make a decision. Understand, three and a half years without rain had passed, and they still hadn't decided to repent about the power worship. Can everybody say the word stubborn? Just not ready to let go of that. I just can't find it in me to do right about that. And God spoke to me, but was that really God? And do I really have to? Remember Naaman and his stubbornness? Remember Pharaoh? They're plagued by frogs. And, and he says, okay, when do you want him gone? He said, tomorrow. How many of us have been living with the frogs in our life? And we keep saying tomorrow. Tomorrow, I'll get rid of that and put God first. Tomorrow, I'll get rid of that and I'll live for God. Tomorrow, I'll get rid of that and I'll stop limping. Tomorrow, I'll get, and I won't be halting more. Tomo or some of us, tomorrow, we get it better and God's just going to go ahead and allow me to limp. He's going to allow me to vacillate. He's going to allow me to have spiritual adultery. That's what it is. That's how he looks at it. I might ask the church in 2021, what is it going to take to get you to seek the Lord with all your heart? What's it, what's it really going to take? Pastor, you are putting us on the spot. Oh, no, 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 no. You put yourself on the spot. How long will you limp? A worldwide disease, just like the plagues of Revelation has struck us. There is economic collapse, teetering in every country around the world. There is political turmoil, racial unrest. There's been riots, everything to biblical proportions. And we sit here vacillating about. You come in here and you don't know if you believe in God or not. And you go home and you're upset there. And you're no peace and you're. The greatest country on earth's political leaders are more concerned with shutting down Dr. Seuss. But yet Cardi B can have the most important famous song of the year. Is that ridiculous to you? then how long are you going to limp? How long are you going to say, you know what, I want still be, you still want to be numbered with that? You still want to be a part of that? You still want to be a part of people that say, hey, little kid, you can't smoke, you can't drink, you can't drive, but let us give you chemical injections to change your gender at five. I don't want those people having a say in my life. I'll take God and the harshness of living for him over that world. I'll take God and his opinion over my little idiot mind and what I think I want. I'll let God make up my mind for me. Are you hearing me?
There's nothing different. It's just like the days of Elijah. Prophecy is happening right in front of us. And that can either make you dread or get you excited. And you know why you're excited? It's because you put yourself on the right side and you don't care what man can do. You don't care what they're saying. You know God's coming back for a church to live as Christ, but to die is gain. I'm not going to get mad at God. It's funny how brave people are until they face the truth. So many people have wavered till their hair has gone gray. Others have been just casual churchgoers for years. Some are so casual in their Christianity. They can't quote one verse of scripture, but they know every song lyric on the radio. So let me ask you this with the how long you will limp question. And I rephrase it. How long will you keep God waiting? How many more Sundays must roll by? How many more days must go by while you're wavering and limping? How many more days are you just going to limp along? How many warnings? How many more funerals will pass you by? How long will you be numb to his spirit? How long will you avoid the altar? that you actually come to and lay yourself down and literally say, thy will, not my will be done. You know, Elijah indicated this choice can be made. It's a simple choice. We shouldn't put off choosing Christ one more day. You, you, you don't know if you have another day. It just may be your turn this week. And this is your altar moment. This is your moment this week right now. This may be the last week that you breathe and get the opportunity to choose a side. Will you be here next service? You know, I'm going to poke at Brother Bruce a little bit. He's a Miami Dolphins fan. No, no, no. He's got a football sign. Is it the, the Super Bowl 72? Yeah. You got a non-Miami football fan over there making comments. But it was kind of funny the other day because, and I don't remember who's in the Super Bowl except I know Tampa won. Who they play? Nobody remembers the loser. Can't see Emma Holmes. And I was tracking up the other day because we were sitting at a table. And I remember Brother Bruce wearing his Miami Dolphins jacket and bringing that football and showing it. But on that day when Tampa won, all of a sudden, man, we won the Super Bowl. I'm like, what? What do you mean, we? You're a Miami Dolphins fan. Oh, I'm a Tampa Bay fan. Look, no, 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 no. We all do it. We all do. You're out in the world. Hey, I'm with you guys. I'm with you guys. Yeah, let's go drink. Let's go party. Let's go. Yeah, I'm, yeah, we're way to end. Oh, church. Tell them, brother, in here, get around a family member. Let them murder the pastor verbally. Well, let them criticize and mock God. Shove it in the face of God. It's the world we live in, guys. I got to make a choice today. I got to make a choice every day. Just like you do that you're going to be faithful to your spouse. And you're going to be faithful to your church. You're going to be faithful to your family. You're going to be faithful to your commitments. Because you're going to be faithful to your integrity. Second Corinthians tells us in chapter 6 verses 1 and 2. We then as workers together with him. Beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, I have heard thee in the time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I secured thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. How long will you live? 
How long will you vacillate? How long will you hold between two? I've said it before and I'll say it again. If you propose to a lady and she says not now, that's a no. <laughs> to delay making a committed decision to God is a rejection. But we know what Israel did, and that is me. A little bit of humor around here. This is deep. But what was Israel's response? How many remember their response? Silence. After all, the man of God that has been. Who's on the Lord's side? Of what? I don't mind giving God a little, but all in? So we he confronts the compromise. He confronts it. And in our way of thinking, wait a minute, Elijah, you're by yourself. It's 451. That's not good odds. And we like to win, so. Sorry, Miami. I'm going to be a Tampa Bay fan today. Sorry, church. I'm at work. I'm going to be a bell worshiper today. Oh, no, all my family, they're going to reject me. If I... The wonderful thing is, even against the odds, Elijah had what we have. He had an ace in the hole because he's got God in his corner. In fact, he's so confident and so committed to God that he'll go down swinging because he was, while they were doing, while they were worshiping, while they were, he was laughing at them. He was heckling them. I'll say like that. You ever seen a worldly person, what they have to do to go be accepted in the world? I love the fact that I don't have to afford that. Only fools have to keep up with the Joneses. I'm walking with Jesus. Only a fool would worry about what the world thinks of you and wanting to keep up, and you got to have this, and you got to have that. I rebuke that yoke. I want to have what God says I have to have. Are you hearing me? So we know what happened with the conflict and all that. Elijah's turn, he called everyone over to him. He rebuilt the torn down altar. Some of us have to rebuild that torn down altar. It may have been torn down by your family. It may have been torn by your own stubbornness and your own rebellion against God in your wilderness. It may be, I don't know who, but it's been torn out. We have got to get the altar back in our lives and get ourselves back on the altar. He puts those 12 stones representing the tribe of Israel. He's trying to reach everybody. They dug that trench around it, placed the wood, cut up the oxen, and said, bring water. Oh, wait a minute. What? We're in a drought, pal. That's how God works. You ain't coming to him without a sacrifice. The fire will not fall without a sacrifice. See, some of you, this is where you limp. During a drought, water was a precious commodity. And God will always require a sacrifice of us in abundance what we think is valuable because God wants to find out where your heart is. He doesn't want you to give what you want. He wants you to give what he asks. And you can't look and see what somebody else has done because the things that I struggle with aren't the things you struggle with. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Ask Abraham as he marched up that hill with his boy. Ask the rich young ruler who thought he was all that in a bag of chips and walked away. So you better get right. You better get back to where you're walking right and you can really hear from God. Because you can't get there given what I give. I can't get there given what you give. Because I turn, well, that lady only, that little widow lady only gave two mites. I'm going to give two mites. Well, let me see your giving statement, Pastor Crow. Here, go look at it. 
I don't want to look at yours. I can give a rip. I better make sure I got my. Right, God. Well, I gave just a little bit more than Brother Crow. Well, you probably made a whole lot more than him. You're the one limping, not me. We compare ourselves among ourselves. We do. We limp. The water flowed around that altar. It filled up the trench. Can you imagine? This is so That's a wife stain. That's a wife stain. Be careful what you call a waste that someone gives. You don't know what they fought. You don't know that. In fact, if you struggle with what someone gives and you, oh, I don't think you have to give that much. I guarantee you there's some place and something in your life that you're struggling. Let me tell you something. There's an old saying. It says a whole lot more about who's throwing the stones and for whom they're intended. You get to a place where you struggle with giving in an area, you better try and say, you know what? You're not going to have me like that. And you... They were, I can imagine the whispers and the comments. We're in a drought and you're pouring 12 barrels of water in the ground, in the dirt. What are you talking about? Bro? What are you Okay, let the fire fall. What, you, what would you hinder it for? You've got to be a sacrifice of something precious. That way God knows where you're at. Put yourself in the shoes of those spectators. What is this dude doing? What is this pastor preaching? What is he saying? He's making a fool of himself. And not only that, he's wasting water. He doesn't care about us. What's he thinking? He's asking us to do this. He... He's wetting down the wood for you. Like, you know what? I'm going to be honest with you. Let me mark this spot so I don't use it again when we say something. So y'all ready for me to say something? Y'all ready? I don't care who you've been or what you've been or who you've been, but before you get frustrated, Pastor, remember this. There are conversations he had with other people that you weren't a part of, and there were conversations he had with God that you weren't a part of. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You, you, you have to understand something. Can you imagine all these people just turning on Elijah? Mm -mm 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 -mm. Do you believe God? Are you going to trust God? Are you? How long will you limp? How long will you limp? It's 50 miles from the circle. God doesn't mind if things look hard. That's where he excels. We struggle there. Gideon asked for a fleece to be wet. Then he asked for it to be dry. Then God turned around and dwindled his great army down to 300 and said, go win. And they did. God doesn't. God used a boy to kill a giant. He used a hostage to survive a lion's den. He took boys to survive a fiery. How long will you live when it's your turn to stand and see the salvation of God? When is your voice going to sound like the voice of God? When is your walk going to look like when Jesus walked? God waited until there was just a Jonathan and his servant. And they defeated the Philistines. God called 12 regular guys to start the church age. He allowed just 120 folks in an upper room to pour out of his spirit. Oh, I didn't just put that in there by mistake. Matthew 3 and 11, I indeed baptize you with water. This is John speaking under repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I. Who shoes? Walk. Walk. Not limp. Walk. Walk. Not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. I'm telling you, we need the Holy Ghost and fire. You need to get the Holy Ghost and he still answers by fire. God is not intimidated. I want to be on the Lord's side. I don't care if we got to pour water on the sacrifice. I don't care if we got to go to lion's den. 
eyes for me and my house. I ain't limping today. I'm walking with Jesus. I got to hurry up. I want to be involved in God's stuff. If that means sacrificing some things, okay. If that means walking away from all the things that America can provide, okay. I'm just going to do something that ain't going to make sense to you. Don't get in my way. Right? How's Brother Davenport saying? I'm robbing this train. I'm going to give what I want to give. I'm going to get up in the morning. I'm going to give myself to Jesus. And I'm going to say, I want to walk with you. I'm going to choose today. That's right. Oh, my God. But they're going to be coming for preachers. They're going to be coming for I don't want there to be a mistake. He who seeks to save his life shall what? It's all geared for this moment, folks. Elijah anticipated the fire. Can you imagine? No one's living for God. They're all vacillating. And he walks in there 450 to 1. He not only mocks him, he's like, put water on this thing. When's the last time? When's the last time you walked for God with a little bit of sweat? When's the last time you had a little bit of sweat? Some of you need to dress spiritually like brother. Laulu does. You need to get the spiritual pinstripes on, some crazy socks, a vest. You need to start. I got a little spiritual. I believe God up in here. I'm going to. I don't care what you say. Uh huh. I can pour water on that. Watch what my God does. I got a little, I got a little Jesus swag on me today. Go ahead and listen to your carnal music. I'm going to listen to what God has to say. Go ahead and follow all that carnality. Get me into the house of the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. I know. He expected the fire. He got so cocky, he's like mocking them. Hard to want the fire when you're vacillating between two sides. I get why some people won't come to an altar. Because that fire is going to burn that pride out. Oh, you're not there. I understand why some people won't come to an altar. They'll never bow their knees to an altar. But that better not be the heat coming on, folks. We need to want it. We need to want can you go get that water? What? We've only got to go get the water. <laughs> I'm talking about getting an attitude. I'm talking about getting some swag. You're not going to stop me from going to church. You're not going to stop. You know what? You dorks want to sit there and worry about a plastic potato and a doctor say, well, are you? I got my nose in a book that's living. I got my nose in a book that met you. What you want? What? Let's see the crux is in, 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 in chapter 18, verse 24, first Kings. And call ye upon the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God that answered by fire. And the God that answered by fire. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly, see God, if you just make a decision in a moment, it all. Suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave. A, I'm still standing. With the God that answers my fire. 
I'm going to stand with the God that answered my fire. That fire is worth more than all the money in the world to me. I may suffer some things in this life. I may sacrifice some things that you wouldn't in life. But I'm not going to be limping. I want to give my Holy Ghost swag back in my step. I don't want to halt between two opinions. Take the whole world, but give me Jesus. The whole world. And even those close to me can turn against God, but I'm standing with the one who answers by. That's right. See, because when you get that fire on you, it'll transform you. You get that fire burning off you, it'll fix your thinking. It'll realign your opinions. It'll make you stand up and stand out. When that fire of the Holy Ghost in you, things become kingdom oriented. How can this? How can my time? See, see, see. People struggle with the church, with the pastor, with the word of God, with the spirit of God, when they're disoriented in the world. But when you step into the house of God and let the fire control, oh, you get reordered. As for me, you're not afraid. You're not pour some water on it. Put me in the lion's den. Throw me in the fiery. I will come out of there with some swag. Maybe it's time some of you start seeking God again. That answers by fire. Maybe it's time you go all in. I ain't limping today. I'm going all in with Jesus. In order to be consumed. By fire, we have to have an encounter with Jesus. In order to have an encounter with Jesus, we need to expect. Did you expect him to be here today? Isn't it funny? We prepare for what we expect. Sadly, right now, there are some people within the sound of my voice on the internet and here that when I give an altar call, I'm still stuck, I'm still crippled. Years ago, this young Colombian girl received a New Testament. She was reading it secretly because her family didn't believe. Her father caught her with the New Testament and told her, don't you read again it. Read it again. It's full of lies. Throw that away. She kept it. The girl kept on reading it, but one day her father caught her again, grabbed it from her hands, put it in his pocket, and went away off to work. Several hours later, in that small mining town in Colombia, the sirens went off. There had been a cave in at the mine, and the father was trapped in the mine. The rescue workers took five days to finally reach the men. All 31 men died, including the father. When they found her father, they found him in the praying position, clutching that little New Testament. When they returned the New Testament and opened that cover, they found a note to the daughter, keep reading. It is true and right. And he said, I will see you in heaven. And they turned to the back of the page where the father had signed. And along with his name was 30 other 
workers that had signed, every one of them sought God. All because a little girl refused to stop staring. Choose you this day. Choose you this day. God right now is looking for those who want to step away from the bleachers onto the battlefield. Listen, listen to me. Living a story worth telling is not easy. <laughs> a friend of mine who's in, into uh, marketing Posted a picture yesterday, came across my Facebook feed. I guess there's a, a new, it's a comic hero movie coming out. And he said, I, I don't know how this is going to be. He's into marketing, so he's not, you know, not concerned about church. But I don't know how the writing is going to be. Because normally this, this person that directs this is too much about computer graphics or whatever. Anyway. But I was like. Does it really matter? It's all fictitious. But living a life story that is worth telling and worth reading. It's like the story of that little girl having a purpose, making a difference, and deciding to stand for something is scary and it involves risk. That is why most people choose to be spectators rather than participators in the kingdom of God. Comfort's comfortable. Risk is risky. In reality, it's easier to watch someone else do it than do to ourselves. I remember when Brother, Brother uh, Pugh preached a message one time, and he talked about one of the football teams had won a game, and they're all out there jumping and shouting after they won the game. And you could see all the guys with their grass stains and their dirt stains and their mud stains shouting. And then joining them were a few guys that were on the bleachers in their uniforms were spotting them. How could they? They were a part of the team, but you know, I want to be in this. I don't want to be a guy on the sidelines That's watching. Right. I want to have a, a, a dirty jersey and some grass taints and maybe a little blood taste. I, I, I want to matter. I, if God's going to write a story and put a movie together, I don't want to be an extra. I don't want to be a stand-in. I don't want to be in the background. I, Jesus didn't die for us to be spectators. You were created to contribute your life, your resources, and your choices to make a difference and to have a role in the kingdom of God. The problem is, the majority of our stories and lives are being hijacked because we live in a consumer culture and we're bombarded by thousands of commercials, messages. Every week telling us what life is about. Telling us what our wants should be. Where our happiness is found. And what our desires should be. And so as a result, most of us are not living stories worth telling. But I believe there's some people in here that can do more. Donald Miller in his book, Mil A Million Miles in a Thousand Years, writes, The ambitions we have will become the stories we live. If you want to know what a person's story is, just ask them what they want. What do you want? There's your story. I don't want to live a boring story. Look, if, if your biggest want is a Roomba vacuum and a new Lexus, That's a stupid story. They're not going to make a movie about, oh, you. If I get a movie made about me, well. He said, just imagining our lives summarized on a movie poster. Come on, we've all been there. Coming soon. To a theater near you. 
What would a movie poster about your life say? My guys are dragging. Sorry, I had to put that in there. This summer. Just imagine you, this summer, Freddie is going to save for a new, larger home. Will he do it? In theaters. You going to go to that movie? Car bought a brand new set of clothes. And now she has her eye. Will she get it? Find out at the brand new epic Steven Spielberg blockbuster movie coming this summer. Corey is working for the weekend. Will he make it to Destin Beach this summer? In theaters, please. Stop and think about what you're doing with your life and if it was put on a poster for you. Think about that. If the epic of your life, see, 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 most of you don't know because I can make fun of this because go back, I'm not done. Keep my marquee up there. He's hot. He's fast. He's got a fair lane 500. Who gives a rip? Who gives a rip? Come see the epic story, the book, the legend, and now major motion picture. Steve is wanting to finish his Fairlane restoration. Will it be finished on time? Will he find the parts he's looking for? Will gas prices hurt his joy? Will Steve be remembered for his fair lane? Don't miss this summer blockbuster movie. You know, there's nothing wrong. I was going to do a Dunkin' Donuts one for her, but the problem is, is that when these things become the totality of our lives and dreams, they distract us from what life is really about. They, they distract us. They hinder us. We were created for more. Than getting things of personal satisfaction and happiness. My movie's pathetic. My script is empty. Those accomplishments are nothing. I want to be in Steve's movie. I, 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 I want to be in his eternal story. Oh God, write me in the scripts today. Oh yeah, I know you got Abraham and Moses and David and Paul and Peter. God, write me in your movie. I don't want to be an extra, a side note, a Demas. Let me on the battlefield. Let my life matter. Let me lay aside the sins and the weights that put me in the movie, Jesus. Write me in like the Davids and the Elijahs and the Ruths. Let's stay standing. I don't want my life being about the trivial things. I don't want to fill my life with trivial things. That's ridiculous. Go back to the other one. I'm sick of looking at that. 
I'm tired of limping, thinking that would be awesome. Steve Grove did. What? Can I say this? When I die, let my name die with me and people speak only of Christ. Anything else, I failed. Anything else, I missed my call. You and I were handwritten to live a story worth telling. You're you. You're the only you. There'll never be another you. Trying to be like somebody else is a waste of who you are and who God called you to be. There's a gap in the hedge. There's a harvest that's ready. Will you have a starring role in the script of eternity? It's God's story. God's story impacts people around us. Mine dies with me. Well, my story goes on forever and your story goes on forever if it's for him. On just the chance, on just that hope today, that there's one person here that's ready to stop limping and ready to walk on in a starring role in the kingdom of God in the story that is eternal